All right. Well, I'd like to introduce you to Ana Nakuda. Um, Ana is a pioneer. Um, she pioneers methods at the interface of I'm sorry, at the interface of computer science, biology, and engineering to study the design of human cells and help eradicate diseases affecting cells of the brain and vasculature. She also is a co-founder founder of a data visual, visualization startup and a frequent keynote speaker in the precision health and medicine industry and academic events, including the, cell, the health cell state of the industry and TEDx Talks, which we'll definitely uh, chat with you about the TEDx Talks as well. So please, if you all will join me in welcoming Emina, it's very, very great to have you here. So I'd love to get started right off the bat. How did you get started with public speaking? You have a, a pretty large background, very in-depth background in um, the medical world. So, you know, people don't think like, oh, speaking um, so much for the medical world. So I'd love to hear how you got started with that. Actually, as a high school student in uh club called Model United Nations. Um, okay. And I was um, a very involved in a lot of different things in high school in my senior year. I was an athlete. I was in drama. I was also in math, Olympiads. Um, and there's this other club, Model United Nations, that every a year had a big conference in downtown Chicago, which is where my family was from. And I really wanted to go to that conference. So I hadn't been showing up for all the the meetings for this model United Nations. And um, I, I went to the teacher who was organizing this conference and the club and asked him whether I could still present at this, at this final conference. And um, he begrudgingly said yes. <laughs> but um, when, when you looked at who he assigned different countries, you realized I was probably at the lower end of the totem pole in terms of what he thought um, I, my presenting skills were. Um, because you were to assign countries based off of GDP and, and your, your, your matching uh, speaking abilities. And my brother, who was a year older than me, got, uh, I think, the United States. My friends got France and Germany. And you go down the list. And I was so happy that I actually I got Fiji. And Fiji is this, a little island um, in uh, uh, near, near Australia that has um, a, a, an economy which is a lot centric on um, its natural resources. And I was thrilled to be able to present at this Model United Nations event downtown Chicago, where I could represent Fiji and its stance on climate change and, and how to um, best protect it from uh, emerging climate change um, influences. And it was just a great event. And it really, yeah, what, what stemmed my interest in teaching and in uh, presenting and more broadly um, giving talks. But that was a very different background than my talks in science and medicine. And, and I really didn't get started in doing more public speaking until I was in college. And then after I started a, a, a couple of tech companies. And um, that was really partially stimulated by I had a really good mentor when I was in college who coached me for for many 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 months on how to present well on the science uh, and the and the tech that I was researching um, in his lab. So nice. that's a little bit of background. Yeah, I love that um, it started when you were so young that that you you kind of got bit by that that speaking bug, and um, were able to take those that that experience and skills and move it over to now where you're you're working in the medical field but also speaking and I would imagine that speaking when it comes to medical information is probably a little bit more difficult <laughs> and um, just because there's there's so much technical um, to it so I'd love to hear you know what are the topics right now that you're speaking about that are the most interesting to you? Like, what are you super passionate about in your field and, and speaking about it? Uh, thanks for asking that question, Francis. I'm really passionate about understanding how we communicate at every level of biology. So a lot of the focus of my research has been understanding how human cells communicate. We, we think of us communicating at a systems level, but internally um, at every level of biology, you have 
many types of communication. So our cells can communicate electrically, they can communicate biochemically, they can communicate by touching, and they can communicate across long distances. Uh, but it's a huge leap in medicine and in science to be able to take what we're studying at the cell level and understand how we respond as a, as a whole human to our environment. And so my focus right now is uh, developing technologies and speaking about those technologies that allow us to bridge from the cellular level and cell communication to how we respond in the real world. So I would call this like um, exp experiential medicine, and that encompasses a lot of different things. People think of virtual reality medicine interactions with people um, under that umbrella, but I would describe it more as encompassing um, silos that we traditionally have looked at medicine in. So often when we think of medicine, we think of a small molecule or protein or gene therapy, or we think of talk therapy, or we think of behavioral therapy, or we think even now more of nutraceuticals, um, or in the brain health, it's neuroengineering aspects. So you can have a device which is helping augment how a brain performs. But um, experiential medicine is encompassing, I see all of those and bringing in one aspect which has long been long neglected and that is social medicine. Our interactions with people on a regular basis affect how our cells communicate in the brain. And there's this feedback loop which is often not studied in detail scientifically. And so I, I see an emerging area where we're bringing in all these domains of medicine to be able to really focus on helping people with neurological conditions. And so that's what I'm really passionate about talking about and also bringing together the component parts, the, the doctors who are often in their own silos, the biotech, the tech, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, they each have their own uh, focus areas. And it's been, um, sometimes at the detriment of treating an individual with a neurological condition. So. Wow. Yeah. Um, there's so much, you have so much knowledge in this area. And um, I wonder how, so you're speaking on a regular basis and you've been a keynote speaker and you've done TEDx. How do you find these speaking engagements and what audience are you looking to speak with and how do you find those? Yeah, so Francis, I um, can say in the very be beginning when I was starting off and, and in graduate school and as a after graduate school and when I was starting the tech companies, I applied. So it was initially you submit as much as you can and then um, your first invites come from those. So you present and people under, people resonate with what you're saying and they the, the bring from that a new invitation. So it, it basically uh, became, uh, um, uh, in a sense, a, a, um, a feedback loop for me that once I presented at one conference, people would um, invite me to another one. Or um, if they learned about my technologies from when I pitched it in a closed setting, I would get a public invite to speak as, as an example to a group of, of women engineers at IBM because they've heard me in a, a different context and they want to learn more about, uh, about the technologies and the applications. Um, and, and it's been very diverse in terms of the speaking engagements. I've given talks at um, pubs and restaurants because of uh, uh, science initiatives. I've given talks to, to, to elementary school students and high school students and then engineers and uh, even had an opportunity to speak in an area where there's a, a, a normal laureate. So it's really been broad yeah. and for each one you have to, you have to tailor it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'd love to hear um, what it was like to speak at a pub <laughs> so, one of the things, so I, I actually don't, I don't drink. So it was a good thing that I was, I was sober while presenting, but right. it's interesting as people, as, as the, um, as the conversations went on in the, in the night that there, that, that people's questions become more and more interesting as they drink. I'm sure. but, uh, there is an initiative that actually started by a colleague uh, uh, called, um, it, it was it, it, uh, Pint of Science, where around the world you can sign up as a scientist to give a public talk at a pub, or now there's, there's talks at restaurants. And it's just an opportunity to meet people who wouldn't otherwise have access 
to the type of uh, presentation you're giving or the, the knowledge that you, you bring as a researcher to the table and vice versa. You learn so much from speaking to different audiences and there's so many different questions you might not have thought of um, in your own research silo that the public can bring up. And so th that was really, really exciting. I did a couple of those in Houston and uh, the audiences were very broad. We had uh, people who were working in the oil industry. We had doctors show up. We had um, a, a mailman show up. So all these different diversities and, and the questions were coming from all these different perspectives. And you have to think on your feet really quickly after you give a talk. And it's, it's an opportunity really to, to see your work in a different way. That's very cool. I love that you've had such a um, so much experience speaking with so many different audiences and in so many different places. Um, what I'd love to hear, what was like, what was your favorite? What would you say is your favorite place to speak and your favorite audience to speak with? I, I actually. It, that's a really good question too. It's it's really varied. I've I've loved the diversity of the audiences. So to if it was always to a similar audience, I think it would be um, I wouldn't learn as much. So the benefit of speaking to to young children about what I'm doing is that you can see that they ask um, questions out of curiosity that other people maybe would be shy about asking. But sometimes they're really um, relevant and they start us thinking down a different direction. And it's also really exciting to engage uh, people at a young age where you know it might change the trajectory of their career. Yeah. But I, I would say probably when I'm thinking about, for me, what the most exciting uh, talks were, were ones where I got to travel internationally to groups which I wouldn't have access to normally. So through speaking, I've been able to uh, uh, travel to uh, Saudi Arabia, I've been in France, I've been in Germany and China and India and um, and uh, UAE and uh, Poland, and all these different places where um, if I wasn't uh, speaking about the science, I wouldn't have access to uh, the culture and, and the scientists in, in this other country. And so for those talks, I think really were, have been very exciting for me because it's a very different perspective, a di different cultural perspective of the tech and of the technology. And for me, giving talks is an opportunity to meet people like yourself and other people in the audience too. I'm naturally relatively reserved and shy. And so if you give a talk, you present a little bit about yourself that after the talk, it's a impetus for people to come up, up to you and ask a specific question about the research. And you don't have to have the small talk in the beginning, it's already there. There's a, a talking point and it helps you learn about people really quickly from your audience. That's very cool. I love that. Um, so another kind of follow-up question um, when it comes to speaking with different groups, what's your process for developing your talk, especially considering that you're, it seems like you're kind of always thinking about the fact that you're reaching different people, you know, from different perspectives. How do you have, what's your process in crafting a talk to be able to reach that whole audience? It, it varies like you're describing for the, for the audience. Sometimes it's very informal or it's uh, more um, show and tell. For the, the younger audience, I actually bring in uh, materials from the lab or I had a 3D display of what we're doing on the computational side. And that's really in, engaging for that audience. For others, um, it's uh, crafting a storyline so it resonates well and people can see themselves in what you're describing or they can see a family member in what you're describing. Um, but to be honest, as a speaker who's also, I mean, my primary role is a scientist and researcher and um, entrepreneur and technologist, you're really busy. So you have to um, be, uh, for me, you have to be very quick in crafting a talk. And sometimes uh, you don't have the concentrated time to do the, the work that's really needed to craft a talk like a great orator would. Like, if you look at the speeches by Martin Luther King or by Churchill, they're, they're lyrical in what they're descri describing their words. And a scientist really doesn't usually have that time to craft that type of a beautiful talk or, or somebody who's a, a entrepreneur or is focused on tech. 
So what I've done is I've I've looked at the day before the schedule, the day before I'm giving a talk, and I block off big periods of time just to focus on walking through the conversation of the of the talk that I'm going to give. And that just really helps me in whatever context that I'm developing the talk, having a concentrated time just to work on it, even though I may not have had the dedicated time earlier. Yeah. That's that's really helped. Yeah, yeah, it seems like it. Um, I so I'd love to hear. We've 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 mentioned it a couple times. You have done a TEDx. I'd love to hear what that experience was like. How did you did you apply? And you know what was that process like for you? So I I was I must someone must have nominated me. I'm not sure who. I was invited by uh, somebody who's in the, the field of data visualization and, and engineering. And um, it, was, it was a great opportunity. That, that year there was a tre- tremendous a lot of things going on in my life. So that wasn't just um, that talk. I, I wanna give the context of that talk. I was actually um, caring for my father who had um, a stroke when he was in his late fifties. And he um, himself was a computer scientist and mathematician one of the starters, people who really began the field of artificial intelligence before it became popular. And when he was in his late fifties, he had a, a massive stroke, which impacted part of the way he interacted with people, part of his communication and not others. So um, at any given instance, you would be able to tell that he, uh, he was suffering from a neuro- neurological condition and other times you wouldn't. And that was the, um, the context of why I'm sharing that is because when I was giving that TEDx talk, he was staying with me in my apartment in Houston. And I needed, I wanted to ha- uh, think about how I can represent um, what we're doing in the lab in a way which shares the, the trajectory of why I'm doing what we're doing and how it can impact someone l- like my father's and vice versa, how my father's health influenced the work that I'm doing and what I was talking about. Um, so, but in that same context for that TEDx talk, I didn't have the time. I was um, an assistant professor and had a startup company and the day-to-day was um, incredibly packed. So there was no training for that talk. There was no coaching for that talk. It was really, I was given the rubric of talk about uh, something related to five, like the, the number five. Oh, wow. So it was a really broad um, ask. And, yeah. and I thought about this and I started writing about it in little bits and pieces the month before. And I realized, you know, I'm, 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 I have a packed schedule and I'm also um, helping, you know, care, be a caregiver for my, my father at the time. What can I do to really have a good talk that, that could resonate well with people? And what I did is I, um, the day before, I I told my father I'm gonna be really late at work, and I uh, booked a hotel room a, a block away from my house in downtown Houston, and I just started practicing, you know, what I wanted to say in in the talk the next day, and if you see that talk, it is a it is storyline of five different things I I learned about individuals, and that storyline was crafted from what I was thinking about when I when I think about. The work that I'm doing and and what I see when I'm looking at people's data and when I look at people's cells, but I was also really thinking about my father and my own experience about how I can present something that people uh, may not resonate with on a normal basis because most people can't see individual um, cells of human cells on a regular basis and people usually don't get to see everyone's data, but a lot of people, one in eight people suffer from a neurological condition. And that means that almost everyone on this call has either themselves uh, uh, suffered from a neurological condition or will, or know someone who does. So I was thinking about how to craft it in a way where people could see the context of what I was presenting and it could resonate better with something about the, their own lives. So that's how that that talk came about. And, and it, that doesn't really help in saying how I got that talk. And more like I would say, um, the more I um, shared my work, whether that was writing about my work or talking to people, the more invitations came. Mm-hmm. And that TEDx talk was a part of it. Uh, starting the startup company with, with two of my students was, was a part of, of bringing in more talk invitations as well. We also hosted a lot of workshops on, on, on techniques where it was free for people to attend. And, and that brought in a lot of different people to, 
and a bigger audience for me that, that led to many talk invitations. Very cool. So in doing a TEDx, I know a lot of people have looked at wanting that being kind of an ultimate goal as um, a speaker. Did you enjoy the experience as far as like working with the the company and, and putting it all together, like as far as the logistical part of it, how was that for you? Yeah, it was actually, there wasn't a lot of overhead. It was really, there was um, one dry run and then the run with it. <laughs> this okay. is what your, your topic is. And um, we, we had a lot of flexibility in, in how we presented um, on that TEDx talk. Some of the TEDx uh, opportunities are much more structured so that yeah. you would work with a coach for, for many weeks and months beforehand. Um, and, and so I think that that varies quite a bit. Um, for me, I think the best thing about the outcome of that talk, it wasn't like it uh, went viral. There were There's lots of people who have really benefited from a TEDx talk. I didn't in that way. But the people who saw that talk, who had a family member, with a neurological condition or somebody who was in a science field related to mine contacted me after that because of that talk. And so it, it wasn't that it, the, uh, the breadth of people that I reached was, or the number of people that I reached was so big. It was the, the people who actually saw the talk and it resonated with them that I benefited from, from meeting from that talk. And I would say that's true of most of my talks that um, you just need to connect with somebody in the audience who really might help bring your science forward or your tech forward or your career forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's, uh, it's that it's, it's making sure that you reach those individuals. And, mm -hmm. and that was a great benefit of, of that talk. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, I'm going to ask another question, but in the meantime, for the folks that are that have joined us, I'd love for you all to um, get your questions ready and open it up to you all um, asking questions. We can do you can do one of two things. Um, you can in the under reactions, you can use your raised hand emoji um, and I'll call on you or you can um, throw it into the chat your question into the chat and we'll try and make sure that we get um, all, we'll go through all of the questions. All right, um, so my next question is, um, has anything ever gone wrong while you've been presenting, especially considering that you present in so many different places? Have you had anything go wrong? And, and if you have, like what, how do you deal with it? How did you, you keep going? <laughs> Yeah, I think as long as you give enough talks, you're going to have everything possible probably go wrong in many cases. Yeah. <laughs> so there was one talk where, of course, the, the slides, I had a PowerPoint presentation slides that they didn't work at all. So I was pantomiming and mimicking uh, graphs, which for a scientist is really awkward. Um, but it, eventually things restarted and it, it worked out okay. I had to, for that talk, really think on my feet as to what I wanted to quickly summarize from um, the, the results of, of a scientific experiment. And so that was useful in that sense. I've had talks where you know I lost one of my heels and not the other, so I'm trying to <laughs> balance while I'm giving the talk and make it not look so awkward. And um, there's a, a video of me on a recent talk last year where um, I had a dress which was two sizes too big and I, and I was tripping over it as I was walking up the podium. And I tried to make a joke about it, about me shrinking during the pandemic and it fell flat right before this big talk in front of an, a dinner uh, forum. And that's always really awkward when you <laughs> have silence afterwards. And so I had to recover that really quickly and think, oh, let me get back to the original talk because that was a spontaneous decision to make a joke, which is always a risk. Yeah. Uh, so so those are a couple of examples of, of yeah. things that have gone wrong and how you'd handle it. I, I, I love those examples. Those are great because those are practical examples that I think everyone has had either in a classroom or, you know, in front of people. So I appreciate that. Um, we do have some questions, so let's go ahead and get going. So our first question, how has speaking impacted the trajectory of your career? So speaking has, as I mentioned, one of the things I really love about speaking is the ability to connect with the audience members and learn more about the audience members. So for me, it's an audience member actually connecting with me afterwards that has changed the trajectory of my career. And that's led to uh, new collaborations. It's led to um, 
uh, for, for business uh, contracts and new invitations. And um, it's also led to uh, opportunities I wouldn't have had if I wasn't public speaking in different countries, as, as I mentioned before, as, as examples. So it, if I wasn't speaking, I, I think I would have had a much smaller world around me in a sense, and, and that would have affected the science and the technology that I do too. And it also, I would act, actually also say, it has made me much more um, uh, aware that, that it's not just my family that, that needs the type of technologies that we're working on. It's a lot of different people and the impetus and the speed in which it's needed is, is, is so urgent that, that uh, it also has empowered me in a sense to speak out more. And I think if you look at some of the best uh, orators and people who give really, really good talks, their goals are you know, to empower the audience and to call them to action, to, to do something, to change. Um, and, and for me, I see speaking as an opportunity to highlight a, a field that needs more resources or needs more people's attention. And when we think about neurodiversity, that's a huge area with a large un unmet need. Yeah, um, there is a follow-up question. Um, has speaking changed your path in a way that you were surprised? Yes, it has. And it has in, in multiple ways. I think actually the pandemic speaking, speaking virtually has changed my career as much as speaking in person at, at big events. It has changed the way I think about technology. And it also, as I, as I mentioned, my lab focuses on uh, ways to understand how human cells communicate, but also how the system as a whole, has a human communicates. And we're talking right now uh, virtually um, on a Zoom meeting, but not everyone can, um, can have the same type of connection to the computer that we do. It's, it seems like something we would take for granted, but the, the light of the web camera or the interaction that we're having right now would be very difficult for some people who, who don't have the same sensory response as we do. And I'm more and more aware of that the more I give presentations. And it's partially because sometimes someone in the audience will bring it up. It's other times because I'm aware that I've adjusted the way I talk between a virtual call and uh, in-person presentation. And that awareness has shaped the research I do and has shaped where I focus the energy on, on the technology company. And, and it definitely has changed um, the trajectory of, of, of work and, and my career. Very cool, love that. Um, we'll go on to the next question um, from Anne. What are one or two ways your talks have changed as a result of this breath of speaking experience? Yes, so so Francis, you mentioned, and I got to see your uh, some of your uh, videos on um, examples of when you've given dramatic presentations, and it's so cool because you can see the response uh, and you can see fa your facial change, mm -hmm. and that resonates really well with people. I think to have that um, have see that emotion on people's faces, and for me, that didn't necessarily come naturally. I think maybe learning from acting or learning, um, practicing more and more how you present um, has helped me shape what resonates better with an audience. So that TEDx talks is an example where I think I, I didn't focus enough on one simple uh, point. And that uh, if I could go back on some of my talks, I would focus on one point and I would have more emotion shown in the way I present. And that's what I've tried to do in shaping um, both more scientific talks and shaping more public talks to, to have a simpler point as the outcome of it. And then to focus on how do I convey that in a way where I don't sound robotic. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. And so our next question, have you ever had a question where you could not reveal information about your research or something you were not um, certain about? Do you accept interns in your startup? <laughs> uh, <but laughs> I like how you slid that in there. <laughs> um, we'll go with the first question. <laughs> um, 
at both actually the first one very early on when I was in college I I took a semester to work at Argonne National Labs um, south of Chicago and I was working in alternative fuels for vehicles with a chemical engineer fantastic researcher and he's the one who helped coach me on, on speaking and I could not talk about what we were doing we were working with a catalyst which was proprietary information and so you had to give this a talk that resonated with the audience and that they could understand the value of what you're doing, but you couldn't describe exactly what you're doing. And that's an uh, that's an art in, in that you don't want to be seen as slick or, or not being uh, truthful. And yet you need to convey uh, something which is so impactful without giving all, away the details. And that's certainly true uh, for, for more recent uh, startup work that I've done. And, and that's also true sometimes for experiments. You want to share, share as much as possible, but it, before something's out there and it's been vetted, you can't always share it. So um, that's a really good question. That's an, that's an art in being able to share things that in, in a way which people understand the, the the impact of what you're doing and and it still resonates with them without revealing what you can't uh, reveal. Um, and yes, we do take interns um, both in my research lab and in uh, the, the startup companies. So uh, feel free to contact me after. And we do also, I see in the chat, there's workshops as well. So um, periodically, we haven't done it recently for um, last year or so, but we'll be offering workshops both on brain health and on data science algorithms and AI algorithms. I'm also part of a artificial intelligence consortium, which has online uh, seminars every Friday that are open to the public. I love that you, um, you provide so much information. Um, so we have another question, I'll just read, it says, I have too much to say and no idea how to decide what to talk about. Any advice on how to focus my thinking or choose a topic um, that would be appreciated? Uh, and more generally, applying to speak at a conference is intimidating, even when it's an intentionally supportive environment for first timers. There are a lot of smart people in my field. I want to pay forward um, the inspiration I've gotten from others. So how do I get over the fear of not having anything unique to add to the conversation? Everyone has something unique to add to the conversation. Yes. Your, your view is unique. Exactly. I say that. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Go ahead. Everyone has a unique perspective. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, there's a lot in, in that um, it, it, it chat text, I would say for uh, being, uh, for your first talks and, and overall, just being a little bit fearless in where you uh, submit and, and um, thinking about the fact like Francis said, that everyone has a unique perspective because you've experienced things different, differently. And that's actually going back to my describing um, experiential medicine. Um, all of us might benefit from different types of uh, environment at different times in our lives. So the optimal environment for somebody um, it might be a specific regimen of specific uh, nutrients and diet and exercise and uh, therapy at one point in their life. But then six months later or two years later, it might be something different because of the experience that they've they've had. And I would say no one's going to replace the experience you've had. And uh, that's a, a key to also giving a, a really unique and good talk. You're, you're, you have that experience and only you would be able to relate what you want to share um, in, this, in the same way uh, that resonates with you and with, with, the, with the public more broadly. Another thing I would share is that when I was um, starting to speak and, and giving talks, I was at a conference, a Whitaker Fellowship Conference. I was funded through this uh, wonderful foundation where at this conference, there was one of the keynote speakers and I was giving one of the short talks. And uh, we ha happened to intersect in the bathroom and this woman was giving the keynote and she was doing what exactly what I do before a talk. She was practicing in front of the mirror. <laughs> And, and I saw her and she saw me and she's, she's just like, oh, you never get, never get over being scared. And I realized that looking back and that um, it's true, even before a big talk, 
most people have a little nerves, regardless of whether you it's your 200th talk versus your first or second. So you just start start somewhere and then and then build up um, and, and and know that um, even Nobel laureates and, and others are going to get nervous before their presentations. Absolutely, I love that. Um, I love that. Yeah, we we all have a unique experience in which we have a unique um, viewpoint. So I love that that. Uh, you shared that. Um, we have another question. What is the best advice? This was actually one of my questions as well. This is from Carolyn. Uh, what is the best advice or feedback you've received? Uh, on uh, giving a talk specifically, is that? Yeah. So one of the things in a, for an in-person talk that really helped me was uh, being able to look at an individual while you're saying one specific sentence or statement and then uh, hold their eye contact for that full phrase or sentence, and then move on to one more person and make your point. I actually think it gets back to the earlier question of how do you keep a focused talk? It's if you're going from one point and then you're pausing and each point you're looking at another individual, you can start to see the progression of your own logic of the talk as well. And so that for me is, is really, if I'm giving a talk in person to a big audience, has been uh, very, very helpful. Um, and Anne, actually, if you're able to uh, unmute yourself, could you share maybe? Oh, about the opera singer? Yeah. So it was, I want to pause that. Um, I'm dog sitting, so the music is keeping the dog happy because the dog and I have just met this morning. So, but we're getting along. Um, so yeah, so she was, so she was a friend of a friend type of thing and she needed to be able, she was new in town where we were living and she needed to be able to get around to some auditions and some performances. And it was just less stressful for her to not have to drive. And this was all before, um, before we did Uber and Lyft that didn't even exist at the time. So for a while I would, I was basically her chauffeur because it was fun. And so I, you were talking about the mirror and she, yes, yeah, she would go into the washroom and, you know, sort of prep. And she always had, um, in her case, she chose root beer, but it has to have the sugar in it. And that's why I put that in there. Cause I thought, yeah, when we're speaking, we often might like have a sip of water, which is great, but in advance, a little coating to the throat is apparently if you're an opera singer, and so I imagine a speaker too. So I just like I just thought I'd share that little tidbit in case anybody's like thinking, what do I need to do physically to prep, right? Mm -hmm. So just so that's why I threw that in. It was a very fun job because I loved I like to get I got to hear her sing, which was like fabulous. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing in. That's awesome. I, I know that there's also a tidbit of drinking uh, like an herbal tea with some honey or just hot water and lemon and honey. Yeah, um, it's the honey. Or, it's the, there's the sugar. It's mm -hmm. the sugar that's coating our throat that mm -hmm. for a lot of us, you're really trying to not take that in. So you might not think of it. Like, I think it's, a, it's an outlier for, for many of us. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that. Um, let's see. I think we have one more let's see yes we do have another question so um you spoke about in the beginning when you were starting to talk you applied a lot of places are there do you have like what are some some companies or groups that you applied with for speaking it's it probably is a bit domain specific but when I was first starting I applied to give talks on uh, my research area. So I applied for conferences that are hosted. Well, some of them are called Gordon conferences and some of them are called Keystone conferences. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, after submitting to a few of these as a, as a student, actually, I got invited to give a couple of those and those led to other talks for the, uh, so I've always been like um, one foot in the door of industry and one foot in the door in academia. So on the tech side, I applied for, um, or actually this was an invited talk. So I had um, started a company when I was a graduate student and uh, Berkeley and Stanford has many schools have business competitions. So I, I submitted for a business competition and I got invited. We went to the 
uh, final rounds. And that led uh, my experience presenting, even though we didn't win the ultimate um, end uh, uh, final award for it, we, I had an opportunity to present many times and that led to a lot of other presentations, including BIO, which is a big conference that's hosted uh, nationally usually. And um, the other, other ones were uh, really important for the companies and for the technologies, but often they weren't public. So they were, a uh, um, uh, public talk might've led to an invite to pitch or to present in front of a closed door. Mm-hmm. So I would say that um, uh, submitting to some conferences, I, uh, just a few of them actually, not um, blanketing hundreds, just be very tailored to those who probably resonate most with your background uh, would be the best bet to that would lead to other opportunities later. Very cool. Yes, thank you. Um, So I have one more question. And then what I'd like to do is um, we do usually have breakout rooms at the end of this so that y'all can meet each other, chat about um, about the, the talk and just you know, get to know some people. Um, So my last question for you is what advice do you have for new speakers? Um, What was the, and also what was the best advice you ever received or the worst advice you received? Uh, So Francis, you've also spoken with a lot of speakers. So I'm wondering, you probably could weigh in here too. I I think about why do people talk and, and for a new speaker, Think about why are you giving that talk? And if you think about really famous orators, if you think about Martin Luther King or Churchill, their first reason probably is to empower the audience Mm -hmm. and to make sure that um, the audience has more confidence. And the second is to empower them to do a specific action, to be motivated towards, uh, in one case, helping uh, ensure that there is uh, more uh, civil rights, or there's there's more equity for for workers' rights, and there's more equity broadly. And, and in Churchill's case, it was a call to arms, literally a call to arms, and and people described it. JFK described it as him uh, 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 having bringing the English la- language and 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 having it off, uh, having the quote wrong, but it is uh, empowering people. And and the English language was his weapon or his his tool. And I, I see that for for talks that you have uh, an opportunity to share with the public that you're asking the public to do something and you're empowering them in the same thing. So before you you start submitting four talks, ask yourself those two questions. How are you going to empower the audience? And then second, what are you trying to empower them for? Um, and if it, whether it's science or tech or you want an investment, all of those would be um, captured in those two questions, I think. And then the third thing would be going back to what I really enjoy about meeting an audience during a talk is that it's an opportunity for you to say something about yourself that is a talking point later for the audience to, to connect back with you. So those would be the three things I would focus on if you're a new speaker, or even if you're not a new speaker, if you're, if you're con- continually speaking and frequently on the circuit, every time you give another talk, those three th- thinking of those three things would, would help, I think, in crafting a talk. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's great advice. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for just having this conversation and sharing your knowledge and experience with us.